And we are live. Welcome, coaches. How are y'all doing this beautiful uh, Friday? Hopefully, it's beautiful where you're at. I don't know. We just got hit with a bunch of uh, rain, and my backyard is flooded. Um, I am here with Coach uh, Mealy. Coach, I appreciate you coming out and coming out, just being here on the Zoom. And uh, for those coaches that don't know who you are, could you give us a little background about what you do? Yeah, I'm, uh, I'm originally from the Northeast. I'm, I'm from New Jersey. I played uh, small school football up there, Division three football at uh, William Patterson University. Um, started coaching up there and then worked my way uh, kind of south. Um, had to stop at St. Peter's College in Jersey City, uh, Wingate University for, for five seasons with Joe Reich. Um, awesome guy. I mean, you get a chance to kind of stop by there outside of Charlotte. He's, uh, he's a fantastic coach and, and great person. Uh, so spent five years there and then made it out to Washington State for the last uh, eight seasons with Coach Leach. Started off as a QC my first two years. Got promoted on the field, um, coaching special teams. Did that for about three or four and then running backs the last two seasons. And then uh, moved over to Mississippi State here in January. And uh, um, it's been a, been a fun journey, man. Started started coaching and had no kids. And now I got four little girls and um, – it's, it's all good. You know, I got my, my girls at home, my boys at work. You know, that's, that's, that's what I always say. Poor girl. What, what's the age range of the girls? So I, I got a, a 12 year old and then I have uh, twins that are 10 and then I have a, uh, a six year old. So they're, okay. uh, we got a house full, man. We got a house full. I hear you, man. I've got, I've got a four year old girl and a two year old boy and elementary school teachers should be paid 10 times the amount of money <laughs> they get paid right now. Uh, we learned that the hard way, right? Yes. I'm, I'm the lunch. I'm the lunch lady right now. Lunch lady needs to get paid more money too. Yes. <laughs> I completely agree. We got some coaches already in chat. Welcome, y'all. Uh, if you have any questions, y'all know the deal. Put them in the chat. When I see them, I will ask Coach. Uh, it's crazy how we connected. We connected through Twitter. I just posted a video of Ohio State running a little arrow route, and I was asking, does anybody do this? Because I think in high school a lot more than college, the running back's not used in the passing game. And then you just was like, yes. And I was like, oh, my God. I kind of – that Andy Dwyer, like, oh, my goodness, is he talking in my thread? Uh, so I know y'all do a lot. Like, what is the big deal? Because I'm trying to tie this in. In high school, the running backs don't catch the ball that much. So how can we get the running backs' hands better so that we can use them in the passing game like y'all do? You know, I think a lot of it is uh, a lot of it's the repetition, which obviously talking about the air raid stuff, or you always hear that word, it always gets thrown out there. But, you know, really pre practice, we're catching tennis balls, and, and post practice, we're getting extra catches in. And throughout the course of our practice plan on offense, they're going to catch a ton of balls, you know. So, you know, you'd like to see some clips, you know, we recruit a high school running back of if a guy's a natural pass catcher or not. And obviously, the more fluid he is, the better, but you can teach a guy to catch a football. I mean, that's, you know, the only times you don't have a problem with the guy's just kind of fighting the football and then just really has brick hands, but you don't really, you really don't see that that often. You know I mean, a running back, even in high school, right. He's playing other sports or he's a running back for a reason. He's one of the better athletes on the field. And we feel like we can kind of develop those skills to get better and better. We had a guy two years ago, uh, James Williams, you know, caught, you know, 83 passes in first career. I think he had 200 plus and he wasn't, it wasn't a real smooth, you know, kind of, uh, you know, pass catching technique with his hands, but he, he didn't drop any, you know, it was just, it's just a matter of, uh, you know, feeding him over and over again. And the whole philosophy behind it is, and again, especially in high school, I mean, that guy's probably one of your best players. Let's get him the ball out in space, one-on-one -on -one matchup and let him do his thing instead of, you know, kind of running into a heavy box and hoping everybody else blocks it up for him so he can get loose. Let's, let's get him loose and let him do his thing in a easier, you know, an easier way to do that. I, I completely agree. Now, the one thing I have, a, I'm having difficulty, and there's like a, a division within the the passing coaches in high school. Is it better and easier to swing the running back, or is it like an a, an arrow or a shoot route to get right to the flat? Which one do you like and why? So we we use all of them. You know, actually, you know, a lot of that's based on game plan. Um, you know, the one thing about a swing is if you're playing a team that's not, you know, hugging the back and pressing the back, if they're spot dropping and creating extra distance away from the back, yeah, then run a swing. Because now you're, now you're giving yourself, you know, so let's say you catch the ball three yards behind the line of scrimmage. 
the defender drops to a, you know, a, a flat area and he's, he's eight yards downfield. You know, now you got 11 yards of space between the two of you. That's what you want. That's what you want our guy being able to do his work open like that. The closer you are, right, the less space there is, and that guy can, you know, he can get lucky and trip you up or kind of just you know, luck himself into a tackle. So um, swing if they're not conscious of the back getting loose in the flat. And then other plays like where it's part of the concept, let's put stress right now in the flat. Let's run that shoot route right now. Let's get him out there and create stretch. And if the guy doesn't stretch with him, you put the ball on him right away and you keep him on the run. So if we ran a play like a Y stick, which is a, you know, a staple of the air raid, um, you know, Y runs his option route, that backer or nickel, whoever's sitting over the top of him, if he's not running with the, the running back right now, you put it on him, he turns the corner and he's up the field. You know, the outside guy's running a vertical, the corner's running with him, and he's, he's down the sideline too. Now, if the guy runs with the back, it creates more room for the Y. So you, you put it on him. So that's kind of the uh, – kind of fits into the game plan a little bit in the philosophy of the play. Okay. Now, are there certain plays – so I take it for like Y stick, uh, it's an automatic shoot route. Mm-hmm. Are there some plays like, hey, we're not touching the back on this. He's got a set route always. And then are there other plays – that are just swing and then how how many is it like is it only a handful of plays that he can swing or shoot depending on the game plan and there's more straight up shoots or what so a lot of the quick game plays you have that those shoot routes right just by nature the, the name of the of the concept is quick game so we want it to happen fast we want it there fast now we could also just bubble them like a fast motion swing uh, to put him out there where he'd wind up. So that's kind of another variation on, on quick game. But if you take a play like uh, four verticals, for example, there's there's a million ways to to use the back. And it's funny, like when we start talking about it, people are like scratching their head. Oh, I didn't realize that there's that much thought process goes into what you're doing with it, you know, <laughs> in the uh, play. But, you, you know, you've got the four receivers going out. So say it's out of trips, you know, you could be on the same side as the trips and have four strong and release to the flat that way. You could have, the ball motion from the weak and runs where the strength is. We sometimes release them through the line of scrimmage and then kind of run like a little out route. Sometimes we release them underneath the line of scrimmage to try and hide them. You know, if a team's looking, you know, if they see him, they kind of mug them up. So we try to tuck them and just burst out of the backfield. So there's, there's little variations on, uh, on a lot of the drop back and where we're really looking for the best way to get him open uh, or to get somebody else open sometimes for that matter. All right. I want to come back to that opposite and, and go across because I've noticed that y'all do that a, a lot, especially on the shallow game. And that really interests me how y'all do that. Um, I'm curious what the, the practice is like for running backs, because you have to both be able to catch the ball and you have to go down with the offensive lineman and, and pick up blocks in the blocking scheme and everything like that. How does that work? How do you balance that? Well, you know, we steal some time uh, from some other periods to do some indie work. And then also some time, obviously, with the, with the old line. So um, pat and go drill is a big drill for the receivers and the quarterbacks. Um, it's kind of a, a warm-up drill where they're throwing slants and, and vertical routes and uh, working their technique and holding the numbers and, and that type of thing. So we'll get in that drill once or twice a week. But the other two or three days a week, we'll kind of get out of there and we'll head over to the sled. We'll you know, work pass pro progression there. We'll work a footwork drill. Um, We'll work any of our any of our indie work, and then on the the next day, we'll have our quick game and routes on air. The backs will always be on routes on air. Uh, the quick game period, if we're not part of that immediate route, like a Y stick that we had talked about, then we'll kind of dive out of there. We'll go with the O line, get an extra inside run period in. So we have inside run built in on one day. The other day, we actually have a kind of an inside pod drill versus a scout look, uh, where we're kind of just working our the double teams, us making cuts off the doubles and reading blocks and, and those type of things. So, um, and then post practice, if you know, if feel like there's something that we haven't hit enough, we'll keep the guys after for you know. Again, we're not going to kill them out there. You know, another couple more minutes, three five, you know, three to five minutes of, you know, working feet, working hand placement, wherever that may be. Um, but yeah, anywhere you can steal some time, great. But you know, another, another period we have is called uh, team run, which we use quite a bit in the spring and then also during fall camp. And it's, uh, it's 11 on 11, and it's an emphasis on run. We call it team run. So it's like an inside run, but one out of every four plays, we could throw a pass. So we run 12 snaps versus the D, and then this way we can run a screen or, or something like that just to keep them honest. But we're trying to, again, you know, make sure the running back is getting his work with the old line. The old line's firing off. 
and we're still promoting that, you know, get off the ball, tough guy attitude from, from our front, even though uh, we're kind of known for a little more of the pass set. So. Yeah, I'm, I'm glad you brought up the run because one of the runs that I really like that y'all do is out of the two back, blue, green. Mm -hmm. um, but it doesn't look like inside zone. It kind of looks like a, a stretch. Is that the way it's just blocked or is, is that something – like, I, I just love that play. And could you walk us through that just a little bit? Yeah, you know, so our inside zone play will kind of morph into a, you know, a mid zone or, or a little more of an outside hit based on what happens up front. I mean, just like our pass game where, you know, you have to be multiple and be able to react to stuff as, as the, after the ball gets snapped. It's the same thing in the run, right? So if you're running inside zone and his eyes are on that front side A gap, um, you know, pre-snap, he sees that the defense, which is going to be popular now with the four eyes, right? He's inside the tackle. Uh, there's a good chance that tackle now is going to block down with the guard and the tackle is going to climb. So that gap that we're looking at is going to get cloudy, you know, and our normal rules tell us, okay, now bang it back door. But just now understanding, hey, there's no edge left. So that inside run now on, on his, you know, third step, he might be start working his way front side, which is kind of the exception to the rule. But it's just based on how the defense played it. So if they came out of five technique, same thing. If he spikes, if they see that, fantastic. You know, they want to, you know, don't overcoach that. Is what you know, I don't want to tell my guys, hey, look for the front side hit, unless it's just blatantly obvious on film. We think we're going to get it consistently. Uh, but if they see that, great, take it. You know, otherwise it's just kind of bang it back. But with two backs, and we've run this a couple of different ways with the lead back. You can block them, you can run a shoot route with them. Um, you know, for the MDM stuff, you can split zone it and uh, we'll have, we'll have a different way. You know, every, you know, every come back and watch the cutups in the spring, we kind of look at it. Do we like it? Do we not like it? How are we going to work it this year? So we got a little new version, I think this year, Mississippi state, that'll be, uh, I think it's going to work out well for us. Now, which one would you rather that guy do? You know, last year, I think, you know, we talked, uh, our old line coach, Mason Miller and I talked to coach Leach in the running split zone and, uh, he was right. He's usually right. You know, uh, nine, you know, 99.9% of the time he's right, even though we think that we're right. So we ran split and it was, it was semi-effective. It wasn't as good as we thought it was going to be. Um, and, you know, lead blocking for us doesn't make a ton of sense because now you have a, a smaller guy on a, you know, on, a, on an edge rusher or, you know, somebody coming from depth. So we're, we're you know, we're going to run some shoot routes out of it because we do that anyway. So we're in 20 personnel and we run a quick game and somebody runs a shoot. Well, he's going to run a shoot. If you don't cover him, we're going to throw it to him, and then we can just run it behind him. So it's going to it'll it'll provide a challenge, I think. That's smart, man. I love that. Okay, because that, like I said, that was when I saw that, I was like, oh, I like I like how y'all run it out of this, and I've always wanted to dabble in it. Um, so y'all running backs are a big part of the the passing blocking. Are y'all still big on big vertical setting, or have you? It looked like y'all kind of went away from that a little bit. What's what's the yeah, there's, it's, it's the vertical set principles. I mean, that's that's one thing. We know if it's a quick game or if it's a drop back, um, that kind of dictates the depth of the O-line. We still have sizable line splits. And, uh, you know, just some of those core principles that, uh, you know, coaches have for years, you know. Um, we're just kind of working a little bit more towards where we think the threats are coming from. Uh, but it's still <clears throat> being the same thing, but we're, we're kind of IDing and uh, – uh, understanding where the blitz is coming from, who the blitzers are, what side of the field we think the pressure is going to come from, or who we're going to work towards, and kind of just vertical set it that way, you know, in that direction. So the pocket kind of moves with, you know, the front, and we stay in front of everybody, you know, but um, not quite the, the old school straight back on every snap, though. Okay. And does the running back still make the calls to the line? Because I know that used to be a big part of the air raid, like, Somehow the running back would say right or left. Is, he, is that still a, an important part of the pass protection? Center, center is big on the calls, right? So he makes, he makes all, the, all the really the, the calls and the protection, which way we're, we're working towards. Uh, the back is going to let him know if he's in the protection, if he's not in the protection, um, and some other tweaks there too, if we're going to change some responsibilities um, with a tackle or a guard, you know, that type of thing. So, um, yeah, a little bit of it's, – it's a communication collaboration between – between both uh, positions there. Okay, because I've, I've wanted to do that at the high school level just to try to take something off of my quarterback's plate, but I never could quite get it. Is there any tips that you can tell coaches? Because I know a lot of coaches want to do that because as if we can take more stuff off the quarterback's plate, especially at the high school level, the better off they do. 
what's something we can do to, to say, hey, running backs, this is what you're going to do to help us out? Yeah, no, I think I think that's the other way to do it, because that was old school wise. That was that was kind of a, the base, you know, back would go up there and he would he would let them know which side on, that he's going to help with the with the line, you know, so they knew which way he was working and they'd work kind of a little bit to, towards the opposite side. So, yeah, and, and even, you know, even at our level, again, take it off the quarterback. The quarterback has to evaluate the box. He's got to understand if it's a run box. Um, is the quick game play the best? Is he going to call a drop back pass? Give him as much time as you can to analyze the defense. Um, you know, count the numbers up, see what this, the leverage is, the best leverage in space, and let him let him worry about that. That's enough for him to, to figure out on his own. You know. Yes, it is. Yes, it is. Um, coming from Wingate and then hooking up with Coach Leach, what was the biggest shock? Because he, he he does have a big personality, and he's not he's not like I think this is understatement like all the other college coaches. What was one thing they're like? Oh, this man is a little different in a good way, not in a bad way, but in a good way. <laughs> well, it's funny. The uh, I'll try and make this short uh, this story as short as possible. But you know, I'm, I'm coaching at Wingate, and, and we're having a great time, and it's a great place to live, and we have, you know it's good football. We just won a conference championship, and um, you know we had run the air raid one year at St. Peter's college. I was there a good friend of mine, uh, Chuck coffee was the offensive coordinator. And I was coaching receivers and uh, just like, you know, a lot of these other guys, we made some big numbers, you know, it's kind of top 10, in the country passing. And um, I really enjoyed the kind of the philosophy and the scheme, the concepts. So got to Wingate and it's a spread offense and I'm, I'm coaching backs there. And we were, we had a pretty good balance going. I think that, you know, the year before I left, we had a 4,000 yard passer and we ran for 1500 yards and it was a, uh, it was a good deal, but coach Leach was out of coaching and I, you know, I had read his book and I had studied him and, and those type of things. And uh, I'm like, you know, if there's a guy that I would work for, you know, at, at the higher level, that'd be a guy I want to work for. He's got a balance in life and there's other interests and uh, this kind of makes football a little more fun and interesting. And, you know, not kind of a guard your desk guy six in the morning to midnight every night. So he was out of coaching. I, I wrote him a letter. I found his PO box address in Key West. So uh, I wrote him a letter. It was really, uh, off the cuff and really like unprofessional and you know just hey BS you're out of coaching you know we get back into it I'd love to you know I'd love to get on your staff or love to chop it up with you that type of thing and uh, ironically I'm out in Oregon at kind of a private little clinic and my phone rings and it says Lubbock Texas on there and I call her ID and I'm like it's got to be Mike Leach you know so I go to the bathroom play the voicemail back and it's Eric Mike Leach Whoop. and that was the end of the voicemail so <laughs> you know so I call him back and he's like, Hey, if you're in Florida, let me know. So literally two weeks later, Hey, I'm in Florida, you know, I took a trip down there. So we do an Island tour from about 8 PM to, I don't know, about five or six in the morning and the, and the roosters were crowing and uh, it, it, we had a good time there. So he invites me back down uh, coach mummy and a couple of his buddies, uh, coaching buddies. We do a little Key West high school uh, clinic uh, about two, three days down there. And it was like the hangover movie part whatever five you know or uh you know football and jimmy buffett's studio and you name it you know a to z and then uh just kept up he gets the job at washington state and i reach out i'm sure you know his phone's blowing up you know he got the job at mississippi state the side note he had like ten thousand text messages i mean something literally like that like unanswered text messages so good lord yeah yeah he, so he gets the job at mississippi state or uh, washington state and then uh I can't get a hold of him. So I tell my wife, Hey, listen, I'm going to go fly out there. He's got a press conference on Tuesday, you know, so I'll be out there on Tuesday. I'll tell him I'll meet him on Wednesday, you know? So I get out at the quality Inn in Pullman, Washington, which is a, which is a beautiful destination for spring break. You know? So I'm at the hotel, you know, I hit him. I text him that night after the press conference, say, Hey coach, I'm at the quality Inn. I'm, you know, what time are you in the office tomorrow? So I flew in, flew out. I'm back in Key West. So now I'm, so I'm stuck at the uh, quality Inn for, <laughs> You know, a couple of days when I told him, I said, hey, I'll meet you, I'll meet you back in, uh, you know, Florida. Now I'm calling my, my dad, my brother, Todd, and I'm like, oh, hey, man, I need some money to help me. Um, I'm chasing around at this point. I, you know, I got three kids at home, you know. So I think he knew he wasn't going to shake me at that point. So he called me, uh, called me back and said, come back out uh, to Washington State. I spent about 48 hours out here. And uh, it was funny because there was no itinerary or anything. It was just me introducing myself to coaches. I'm sitting in meetings. Kind of just hanging around and then finally on the on the second night i got a red eye out in the morning it's about 11 o'clock at night and he says hey you know the job pays this and you know i know you got a bunch of kids at home i don't be a distraction for you you want the job 
And I'm like, hell yeah, I want the job, you know? So I call my wife. She's like, she's like you got the job. I'm like, hey, did we get enough money? I'm like, well, we got about half as much money as we're making now, you know? So sell the house and one of the cars and all the furniture, you know? She's like, well, what's the job? I said, I don't know. Just offer me a job. And I said, yeah, you know, so I get out there and, you know, first day I get out there and somebody introduces me as like the, uh, you know, the quarterback's quality control, you know, Coach Leach's assistant type thing. So I'm like, well, that worked out well, but he's been, he's been fantastic. You know, he, he took care of me, uh, you know, after the first season, you know, kind of gave me a little breathing room with the Rays. And then we made their first bowl game that second season, uh, promoting me into the field for, for year three there. So he's, uh, we spent a lot of nights in the, in the war room, Sunday nights and, uh, you know, Saturday nights and then Mondays even with the game plan, but everything from, uh, Pizza places, mafia, Vikings, you know, why, why cross against this team? We should post the guy, you know, and just everything in between, man. It, it was, it was just a, and it's been, it still is. I mean, it's, it's a great time hanging out with them and, um, or, you know, really enjoy it. So he's as legit as the, as they say, it's, it's not a facade. It is, that is, that is who he is to a T. No doubt. No doubt. And you got to have your phone on, you know, late nights because that's when he's, uh, He's at his finest, man, you know, for, for good conversations, you know. <laughs> that is, okay. Uh, and, hey, I love that you shot your shot, man. That's what, yeah. that's what we tell the kids. Just shoot your shot. What's the worst that can happen? They say no, that, that's, that's okay. Um, so you ran the, the air raid at, at Wingate, but you, you're now learning it from the man that's, like, created it. What are some big differences between what you were running and what is actually Coach Leach runs? He, you know, really, this, the system is such a machine that, you know, that we stick to it, you know, and the, uh, the game plan piece, I think, is really, uh, I think it's different than a lot of other people, the way they game plan, you know, how we do that. And then... Uh, could, you, could you give a little, a little dive into that just a little bit for coaches that yeah. don't know? Yeah, so we all individually come up with our game plan, you know, so he wants our best plays in the open field and then all the situational stuff, red zone, goal line, third down by distance and um so we all do it individually because we're trying to eliminate that kind of herd mentality right so you know if you like a certain play and i'm like oh that sounds good y'all yeah, do that too we kind of try to eliminate that and then we all come into the room um you know that evening after watching all the film come up with our game plan uh so you put up your versions of um y cross you know so you're gonna have you like it best out of two by two i like it best out of three by one Somebody else wants the motion from two by two to three by one. Somebody wants to post the X. We all have our different reasons, right? We have films, evidence to back it up or whatever it may be. And then we have to, uh, you know, we do that for every concept on the board. We have our core you know, plays up there. Um, then when you're done, there might be, you know, 80, you know, 80 to 90 plays up there, but we're only going to carry 30 plays into the game because um, we can only practice those plays X amount of times throughout the week. So how do we pair, you know, 90 down to 30 is, is basically what our challenge is. Instead of adding plays or, you know, guys drawing up new stuff all the time, it's a little more of uh, how we can run our best stuff and what's the best version of our best stuff versus this opponent. Um, so, you know, you get a little, you get a little um, back and forth and uh, see whose, whose stuff sticks. And then that, and that's how the stuff goes on to the game plan. So I think it's a, it's a good way to do it. And, and it bring, does bring some fresh ideas so it doesn't come in with the same, you know, the same concept, you know, the same way of running the same concepts all the time. Um, that's been good. That's been really good for us. So that it seems like he's bringing in his, his lawyer background and having y'all defend what you believe in. Yeah, there's, there's definitely some of that. And, and usually he, you know, he's, he's the last one with the gavel. So he wins at the end, and, you know, <laughs> the judge and jury at the end, but. All right. So let me, let's say, or let's say I, I like white cross by the two by two, three by one, and some kind of motion out of blue, blue, green, or motion in general, or is that three different concepts? So does that count like three times into that group of 30 or is that just one? So that's actually just one play and you still have 29 left. Yeah. Three, three times, three times. Wow. So it's gotta be, you know, if you practice something four times or did something four times, right, it can become a habit. So kind of our thought is when you go into a practice, if you don't practice that play four times per practice, you're not getting better at it. It's not becoming second nature. You know, we need to be able to run that Y cross play, whatever version of that play that week and be able to respond immediately to, Hey, why, why is hot? If this guy blitzes, Hey, why is going to run this one and stop before, you know, as soon as he gets over the center, he's going to stop because it's a big dead spot or he's going to keep running because he thinks it's going to be man coverage. But 
he's got to have all these answers versus whatever defense gets thrown at him. So we can't practice it five different ways and be really good at reading and reacting on the run like that, you know? Now, okay, I like that. Let's say I, I choose just two by two and two back to run Y cross. But during the game, I realized that three by one Y cross would actually be good. Do you do you bring that in? Or is that like, nope, we didn't practice it. We just live by what we, we've we game planned. So early, early in the season, I, I think there's probably a little bit less of that. But by the time you get, you know, midway through the season, you're practicing those plays from camp all the way through. Yeah, you know, we, we can definitely, we can pull something out of our, and the quarterback will do that sometimes too. You know, we had a quarterback, a couple of these guys, you know, Luke Falk, who I still, you know, talk to, man, is a great kid, man, he's, He'd pull plays out of the archives, you know, from two, three years in the past. All of a sudden, like, he'd make a check. Did he just check early 94? You know, so we wouldn't have that. It's not even on our menu on the game plan period for the whole season. You know? he's, he calls it and runs it, you know, so. <laughs> and then what, what's that? What's it like on the on the sideline? Do you just like, OK, the, I guess he has that freedom or is it does he have to come to the sideline and defend himself while he did that? Well, he better hit the play. He better, he better complete the ball. You know? <laughs> <laughs> you know, all the plays, you know, Coach always says that the plays, are, they're all suggestions, you know, because the quarterback is the last one to read the defense on the field. So if, you, if he calls a bad play, it's on the QB. I mean, he, you know, he's got the, he's got the you know, ability to change that play um, anytime he wants to. So he gets last looks and he, get, he gets the authority to do that, but just make a good decision. And that's when, you know, we watch film the quarterbacks – you know, it's always the kind of the line of questioning is, well, why did you call this play or why did you check that? Why did you start on this side of the field? And just have a good reason, have a good plan. You know, if, if they have a good plan out there, they'll, they'll be effective, you know, as long as they understand why they're doing what they're doing. Okay. Uh, I want to kind of circle back to the pass protection because that kind of, that's what I want. I don't know that much about when it comes to the air raid. Sometimes y'all are free release and sometimes it's check release. Sometimes you just stays in. Are those three different calls that that come from the coaches, or is that based on the concept, or is it game plan? How does that work? So the free release stuff typically is a concept. You know, there's times where I know uh, you know Gardner Minshew would tell uh, tell our back to free release if he thought that he had a matchup that he liked there, or there's leverage. He just want, he wanted him to go and throw it to him. So there's that that ability to, um, but for the most part, you know, any of the drop back stuff, we're typically in protection. Um, when you watch our clips, I think sometimes that gets skewed a little because people are like, well, he, the back just took off there. Well, that's, that's part of, uh, you know, that's part of coaching our guys up. I and mean, we're going we're gonna to spend a ton of time understanding who the blitzers are and where they're coming from and being able to read demeanor too. I mean, understanding if the guy comes running into the backfield, but he's staring us down. The guy has us in man, you know, he's just, he's adding into the blitz. We're out of there. You know, somebody has to cover us. You know, that's, that's always the answer, you know. And we'll even go as far as uh, we'll make some we'll make some wild noises out there on the field, um, the call for the ball, and also you know if we take off and made a mistake, and our guy blitzed, we'll throw it to me because that's the guy who's supposed to be covering me. We do, yeah. that, we're, we're in good shape again. So uh, we spend a lot of the time in that drop back trying to get our back out as much as we can, and we always want the bigs blocking the bigs. We want us blocking the little guys, and then uh, hopefully you know they're not blocking anybody. You know is really what the goal is. You know. Let's circle about the weird noises out of the backfield. Now that's something I tell our backs. Okay, listen, if 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 you're wide open, you know, make a ball call. Uh, but they don't hear it. Do you have any suggestions besides taking that big mouthpiece that everyone likes to wear now for some reason and it muffles it up? Any tips, tricks, anything like that? Yeah, the the, the tip is <laughs> it's gotta be a high pitched or uh you know, I bored you last year was more he couldn't he couldn't go the high pitch route, so it was more like a Hey, you know, you know, coming from a got to come from the diaphragm. That's my that's the tip. You got to come from down below. But whatever is the you know the most kind of you know high pitched kind of shrill you know thing you can come up with. But you know our rule there is if he doesn't get five yards, and he calls for the ball. You know he's he's going to come on the sideline and hang out with us. You know so it's got to be kind of like we talked about before. Hey, there's about ten yards of space here, and that guy cover me is you know head up to inside leverage. So I haven't I you know I got some more space to, to the uh, sideline. You know, so you got to get yourself, uh, you know, a positive uh, gain on that play. And understand also down the distance. I mean, it's third and 20. I don't, I don't need the running back howling for the ball out there and, and catching a ball and picking up seven yards and that type of thing. 
but it's uh, it's definitely something that we that we work on a little bit for sure. Okay, uh, coach in here says give the the Ric Flair whoa. <laughs> that would work. No, that would work. I'm, I might try. I'm tell them to start using that. We don't need the the whole the hand motions either. But <laughs> yeah. All right. I, we've got a lot of questions in chat about pistol. Are you a big fan of pistol? Because I know some teams at the high school level like the pistol because the defense can't read off the back. So what are your thoughts on that? So we don't do much of it. Um, <laughs> one thing for us is uh, we want everything to look the exact same. You know. So our our split, you know, in a, in a quick game shoot route and our split and in running inside zone should look the same. Our footwork and all the run plays is going to look the exact same, you know. So whether you're running draw or a gap scheme or, or running zone, same footwork, you know. So um, we don't do it. And then, you know, our, our kind of answer to that is so they can't set to you. So if you're running, you know, backs off set to the right in the gun, you're running zone left. Um, maybe you're running zone right. You just don't flop the back over and he runs – you know, that same side zone from the alignment that he has. So there's enough stuff that we can do, again, with the motions too, when we start bubbling guys around. Uh, we'll flop the back some, you know, teams that set their front and then don't move. Um, we'll, we'll set our back. They get set. We call a play, and we just flop the back over to the other side and then run that play. So those are kind of our answers. You know, the I guess the one big reason is, you know, the amount of pass that we have in pass protection, we don't like, you know, having the back coming from directly behind the quarterback to get those angles on edge rushers. Because again, we want to, we want to block the interior box with the bigs and put our guys on nickel safety edge pressure, you know, weak linebackers coming off the uh, corners if we can, you know, that's just kind of our first thought there. Okay. That makes sense because I don't know, probably in high school, if you drop back and the running back's got to get around the quarterback to get in the pass protection, you could have a, a collision kind of like two guards when they pull and they smack in the, they pull in the right. wrong direction. Right. We've all been there. We've all been there. <laughs> yes, we have. And then we all point fingers at everybody else and say, that's, that's not my fault. Um, I do like how you're back. And I've noticed, I don't know if, this is just for the shallow play or for everything, how the back's on one side and he releases to the other side in the flat. Is that game planned? Is that just how the y'all are starting to do things now to like mess with the defense or what? But could you explain that to us? Because I love that concept. Yeah, well, you know, we can game plan that on four verticals. We can game plan that, you know, on shallow. That's that's part of the deal. We kind of we replaced the space that the shallow runner came from. Uh, but really kind of that same path is what we'll use um, when you have a bunch of vertical route stuff and he comes across. But so we will, we will game plan on other plays as well, because what it does is we can pass protect coming from across the formation. It makes it a little bit easier for the back to get out into his route as he's working his way towards his threats. You know, so he can look at the guy on the same side that he's on and look at the next guy on the opposite side as he's exiting. If that guy's not blitzing, then he just takes off on his route. So it actually helps him get on his path and get him out to where he's supposed to go. Did did y'all stumble upon that? Or has that always been a part of the air raid that coaches just haven't noticed before until now, until the internet? <laughs> yeah, it's probably it's probably some uh, some nuancey stuff. I mean, even even a play like why stick, you know, you have we have backside slants on that, which is part of our quick game, um, you know, base concept there. But we've also flopped the back over to the weak side where the slants are at and ran a shoot towards the slant side and left the stick in the vertical route by itself, you know? So there's, there's reasons, you know, methods to the madness and it's, and it's got, you know, stuff that you see on film and also just a break. To it, you know, that's, that's the other part, you know? So um, even though it's the same play, you move the back over and shoot them weak now, instead of strong, it changes the whole thing, you know, changes the whole dynamic and um, gives you another a little wrinkle that, you know, without really teaching too much or having to coach too much, Hey, this week we're just going to run, you know, we're going to come across the formation and release to the flat instead of being on the same side. And that's everything. Okay. So let's go, let's go back to the, to the stick and you're shooting the back away from the stick. Does that change the read at all for the quarterback or is, is he thinking of something else? Like what? Yeah. So base, base concept for him, you know, if he's on the read side, you know, he's reading the vertical first and then this, and the stick in the back, you know, that's, that's kind of how it goes. One, two, three there. Um, but if he, you know, the slants are out to the field and you have two over two out to the field, he can start on the slant side anytime he wants. If he likes that leverage better immediately, he can just go over there and throw a slant route. So I think, you know, game plan wise, we would do that if, if a team, uh, if we felt like the backers were screaming with our backs and they're, and they're really kind of conscious of us, 
we might put him out to the to the slant side, shoot the back. There goes the backer at it, you know, chasing him. Here comes a slant replacing him. There's nobody in the middle of the field. That slant can go, you know, can go 60, you know, that type of thing. All right. Now, is that game plan or are you giving the quarterback the freedom to do that in the game? Because I know they have a, a lot of freedom. That one's a little more game plan now, but okay. he has the freedom to, to start on whatever side he wants to start on. And that goes for pretty much any play we have. You know, you have a couple plays that are really true progression reads, like Y cross, where he kind of, you know, it's a left to right read, that type of thing. And he works his way down, you know, kind of to each guy. But any other play, any play that's multiple, he can start wherever he thinks he's got, you know, best leverage press coverage and he likes to match up. If they're, if they're outnumbered somewhere, you know, to a trip side, let's say, he can, he can just turn and throw it to those guys. You know, he can call screen anytime he wants. He can call it run anytime he wants, you know, change the pass. So it's uh, he gets a good bit on him to be able to just kind of eval that box and eval the defense and see what's best. Did you do that while y'all were at Wingate? And if, if you didn't, was that a big adjustment when you actually started working for Coach Leach? Yeah, you know, that, that, is, you know, that is a big deal. You know, and also the, just the, uh, the hand signs and the, the silent language, you know, was huge um, because everything is communicated that way. And then, you know, we'll script, you know, for the quarterback's uh, wristband, you know, kind of a couple different options on there, you know. So it might say, you know, uh, and for a, a new quarterback or a younger one, it might say run on there. So he just reminds him he needs to check the run box. Then it'll have like a like a drop back pass game connected with a quick game pass game. So if the drop back isn't going to be there, we have kind of the complimentary quick game play we think is the reason why that play is not there pre snap. So he can kind of just work his way down through those plays. Yeah, you know, and the Wingate was a little bit more of you know he could audible, you know, he can audible out the play, but it wasn't as many kind of combo calls in one. You know, it was kind of like, hey, here's the play, and we're gonna you know you can read either side of it, but it wasn't as, as multiple. Okay. Could you give us an example of a, a drop back pair to a quick game and what the quarterback should be looking at? Because that's something that a lot of coaches want to do, but they don't really know how to teach that to their kid. Yeah. No, I, I think generally speaking, the reason would be is if you call a drop back pass, and we have two different thoughts of it too, but if there's heavy blitz, you know, mm -hmm. and seeing that, you know, you can obviously check to that quick game play that's kind of listed after it. At the same time, if you feel like, you know, we can, you know, we call a good protection and we like who we're throwing it to, you know, we can win. We're, we're going to keep that play on anyway. They're, they're in man coverage. We're going to, we're going to, we're going to roast them, that type of thing. But um, yeah, it might be something like, uh, you know, just use, like, use Y cross again. So Y cross is yeah. there and then it's married up with, uh, it's married up with, uh, you know, Y stick, you know, so really it's a play for the Y, you know, the, or you got to the heavy kind of, but you still go through your reads, but you know, if they're, if they're you know, playing a certain coverage we didn't see all week, or, or there's something different that we don't like that we're getting. Okay. We didn't like the X last time getting pressed. He got beat up, you know, on, on, on Y cross and, and, you know, the H isn't there and um, you know, it, it's blitz here. We can throw Y hop, you know what, let's just call Y stick. It's, it's second and six. We can get an easy first down here. Let's do that. So, some of that's game management too, I would say, from the quarterback. He's got to understand down and distance and where we're at in the field and make good decisions, you know? Okay. I like that. I like that. Now, going back, you said that you – Coach Leach gives you the ability to, like, formulate your own game plan and you have to go and, and defend it. When you're doing that, what are you looking at as an offensive mind, like, are you looking at a certain player to attack or a certain field? Like what's your thought process when you're making your own uh, game plan? I think, you know, pass wise, I think it's just the biggest thing is how do we get as many guys open as possible per pass play? You know, so really the matchup thing would be more of if it fits in the, the general scheme of what we're running, you know, Hey, this week, we really like our X versus their, their corner. We, we feel like that's a mismatch. We're going to, you might hang on him for an extra half a second on your read, but we're not going to change any of our plays based on, you know, the personnel because they can't cover everybody. That's, that's going back to the basics. You know, we're going to put five guys out there, whether it be three receivers and two running backs or four receivers and one running back, or we even go out there and empty. So our five guys, we're going to, we're going to, you know, space that field out horizontally, you know, use every, every bit of yards horizontally and all the yards vertically and make that defense adjust to everybody out in the field in these, in these different spots in the field. So uh, we just want to get as many people open per play as possible. Um, and then based on, you know, and obviously teams have wrinkles, but 
they're going to be married to a certain coverage. Hey, is, is it a one high team or a two high team predominantly? Are they, are they blitz heavy on certain downs or, or are they not? You know, and these things, you can break tendencies, but if they're going to do that, they're obviously changing their game plan to defend us, which is, which is already a kind of a psychological win and a win in our favor, in, you know, generally speaking, because they're doing something that they don't normally do. You know, so it's almost like preparing for an option team. You only see them once a week or, you know, one week out of the year, you only have a few days to prepare for them. Really, even the SEC, it's gonna, I think it's going to be similar to that. I mean, teams, I don't think the SEC are going to be built defensively to kind of, you know, match up the way how we, how we do things. You know, you're going to have a big old linebacker, 235, you know, 240 pounds in the middle, and then have a running back out there in the flat somewhere. We, and we're not going to run him straight at the guy. That's not the plan. The plan is to run him lat, you know, laterally first and horizontally, make that guy chase him, and now make that guy go tackle him in space, and let's, let's see who wins, you know. How difficult is it to game plan? Because like you said, y'all, are, it, it's almost like an option. So do defenses like change wholesale when they when they play you like some teams do against the option? Or like I, I know y'all throw it a ton and a lot of other offenses don't throw it half as much as y'all. What are y'all looking for defensively when you're breaking down film? So, you know, big thing is, you know, it's always about beating the blitz is first and foremost. That's always the worst case scenario, right? So we have to have answers for pressure, all right? So when you game plan, the teams are going to play one of two ways, you know, against us. And that's, that's really, there's, there's not a ton of things they throw at you, you know, minus the way they disguise blitzes, you know, in their coverage. But they're either going to be, they're going to try and press you and they're going to play man coverage, or they're going to try and drop, you know, eight guys and, and play soft and keep it in front of them. And that's really, it's as simple as that. So we're trying to find out if they're going to drop all this coverage, you're not going to get as many balls over their heads down the field. So how do we keep attacking and getting chunks and, and you know, not just, um, you know, another one of coaches fears, we're not just bunting, you know what I mean? And just taking, you know, three, four, you know, three, four yard completions. Like we still want to get some chunks, you know, those mid range balls down the field. What are the best plays to attack that drop eight coverage, you know, and then, and then on, the, on the flip side of it, Hey, if they're going to be a press team or they're going to, they're going to gamble more than most people. You know, we want to make sure that we torch them when they do that and get them out of it because then we can just, you know, we can just call plays and just run the ball, you know, uh, pass and run the ball down the field and kind of do whatever you want. If they're just going to sit back there and keep it in front of them and just kind of take it, you know. Which one would you rather go against, a, a press man blitz or a drop eight or nine type defense? I mean, hey, as a running back coach, you like that drop eight or nine, man, because, you know, then we get those light boxes and then we get the run checks, you know, I think – we averaged, uh, you know, six and a half yards a carry or something like that last year, you know, so it's, you know, we can get our guy up on the, on a backer, you know, on the second level without getting touched. That's, that's good stuff for us, you know, so you like that. And then obviously, you know, the fun ones are when they do go press or they take their chance and then, and then we kind of go over the top on them and, uh, and it just go, goes back into that chess match of, Hey, we're going to do this. We're going to do this. We're going to do this. Okay. You guys got too tight balls over your head, you know, that, that type of thing. Okay. Uh, getting on to, to game plan, Coach Leach still calls us plays without giving away everything. Like, what, what's the game day communication like? Because that's something I, as, as an offensive coordinator, I'm trying to get better at with the guys on, on our staff. Like, does he give you all certain roles during the game? Or is it just like, hey, shut up. I've, I've done this enough. I know what I'm looking for. And if I ask questions, you can answer. Uh, how does that go? Yeah, he, he's, got a, he's got a key – Kind of, kind of set of things that we're looking for, and we don't talk coverage um, you know, too much at all. I mean, obviously, kind of the things that he looks for is is it a one high team, is it a two high team, because um, that that'll affect some of the some of the plays that we call or you know beater plays that are better versus one high or two high, and then uh, you know is it man coverage or zone coverage, you know, predominantly, um, and are they blitzing? Those are really the a lot of the information that he just likes to receive. Um, you get a couple series in, you can get a pretty good beat on percentage wise. Hey, first down, they're going to be in too high and then they're going to be sitting back. They're not going to blitz and second down they're one high and they're blitzing, you know, that type of thing. So he knows what plays the call, you know, he's just, he's just getting validation on what they're in and because we're seeing it up top. Um, and then a little bit of it is uh, just kind of painting the picture of what, what the quarterback did, you know, you gotta, you know, it's harder to see Hey, we called a certain play but he started opposite of the concept side because he, you know, he saw this, that, you know, he saw press coverage, but the guy got jammed. So he moved off of him, went to the second receiver. He was covered. He checked it down to the back. You know, it's a good play for us. If that guy could win on the press next time, you know, so it's just, 
you know, good reminders or validation for him. But like you said, I mean, he knows, you know, he knows the play, you know, he's, he's going to call and that type of thing. And then, you know, if there is pressure, you know, who gave up the pressure, what's the best run play? What, what are they giving us in the run box? Um, and then any of the little sidebar stuff like that. But for the most part, he just wants to know how they're playing us. And, and it's pretty general, you know, because you just give him a little bit of a picture and he knows exactly what he's going to call from there. Okay. Are you giving him that while the, while the offense is driving, or is that all the information he gets after that drive is over with? Right. So just as you're going on, it's more of, you know, the quarterback picture. Okay. You know, so he's calling the play and then, then, you know, again, a series or two in, you're telling him, Hey, second down, big blitz down here, coach. You know, he calls the play he likes versus the blitz, but after the series is over, then you get the recap. Then then it's the recap. Hey, listen, they're, they're 75% blitz on third down. They're, they're less than 10% blitz on first and second down. Best run down is on second down, you know, those type of things. So now he's just kind of making mental notes and, and maybe, you know, dotting some stuff on that little, little index card he's got down there. <laughs> does, does he keep those? Because in my mind, I, I envision like a baseball card type notebook that he just slides it in when the game's over with. And Yeah, that's, that's pretty accurate. That's, that's fairly wow. accurate. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> yep. we, we have so, files we have files on files of uh we got the hard copies and we have the you know the obviously the uh, computer stuff but he's got boxes and boxes that, that's the first thing like in mississippi state i grabbed uh i had a carry-on it was the only thing i had with me in a backpack and the carry-on was the last three years worth of files jammed in there as best as i can get them i mean didn't want to lose them didn't want to check them in didn't want to you know leave it behind so we got that in his desk. First thing, you know, first things first. And he's like, everything is safe. That is awesome. Mm-hmm. Um, what's the biggest like shock, I guess, from going from the Pac-12 to the SEC? Is there a difference and the media is just like blowing smoke up everybody's butt or can you tell the difference between the two conferences? Uh, I, the hype is real. I think the hype is real. <laughs> you know, the, uh, there, there's some creatures running around on our campus. I mean, we had, we had some good players we were at, um, you know, you get to Mississippi State and we're doing the, uh, you know, the midnight maneuvers, off-season conditioning stuff that we do, you know, and the, probably one of, the, one of the most fluid groups I'm watching is a D-line group. And, you know, you got a bunch of guys that are 6'3", 6'4", 280 pounds moving around like DBs. And, you know, we had, we were a little bit light on the D-line, you know, previously in the Pac-12. So I think you just got, you know, the sheer size of some of these guys across the board you know, um, overall, it's just, it's pretty impressive, you know, and just real competitive nature and, and, and they're fired up and uh, there is a different, it feels like a little bit of a different feel to it. And then, you know, on so, you know, personal notes, like if you go walking around in town and people are recognizing the running back coach air raid, that's, that's, uh, that's not, that's, that's unusual. You know what I mean? It's usually, it's uh, hey, there's coach Leeds and then it's, hey, coach Mealy, we're you know, glad to have you. I'm like, well, shoot, man, these guys know who I am now you know, too, you know? <laughs> Oh yeah, they're they're probably uh, update the ones that are updating your uh, Wikipedia page and everything yeah, like yeah. that. <laughs> All right, you said something that tickled my fancy a little bit. Midnight drills, or, or what? What is that? So everybody else is, uh, you know, the match drills that everybody does in the off season. You, you get eight of those. Um, typically, teams are out there at five o'clock in the morning or six in the morning doing that kind of thing. Um, they actually changed the rule. We used to go at about ten p.m. to midnight and do our drills on the back end, but they pushed it up for, they want to make sure the guys get their sleep, that type of thing. But we still go in the evening. So we go at like five o'clock at night or six o'clock at night. Um, so we're done in time uh, with the regulations, but we go out there in the evenings. Um, we, we got a pretty cool grading scale. So, you know, if you're kicking butt, you get a black t-shirt, you get graded every night, every drill. And there's kind of a bell curve. The coach has got this, uh, he's got a beautiful mind thing going. And he, <laughs> you know so some guys get a black shirt if they're killing it if you do just okay you get a gray t-shirt for the next night and if you don't do very well you get a pink t-shirt a size too small for the next practice so it's uh it's a little bit of motivation for those guys to you know to get out of the pink and, and try to earn the black shirts and uh there's a whole comprehensive you know thing we do with uh you know teams we have a kind of a draft and, and different groups and uh team competitions, individual competitions, points for going to class and missing class, deduct points, um, tug of wars and water polo and uh, just a lot of, a lot of competition. And, uh, uh, but that's, that's kind of how we, uh, he dubbed the term midnight maneuver. So that that's been our, been our thing for a while now. Okay. Like what, what other drills besides, first off water polo, just go ahead and give me the pink shirt because I can, 
I, I, I would struggle with that. Um, <laughs> what other what other drills do y'all use in there though? Because in my mind, I'm envisioning him doing something different than what other programs are doing. Because that's just who he is. The water polo is modified, so it's we're in the shallow end, and it's more like okay, good. <laughs> yeah, it's a, it's a WWE uh, water polo version of, of guys, you know, wrestling and uh, you know, stealing the ball from each other and scoring goals. And um, yeah, you know, it, it's funny when I first got there too. I I, I had a little bit of a hand in uh, um, trying to organize as many of these drills, make them as kind of unique as possible, and just everything was about a winner and a loser. You know, that, that's. And some of this is getting to be, this sounds like it's starting to get old school because, you know, moving the, the Blue Ribbon Society now a little bit. But that's, you know, we're, he's never going to break that. And that's kind of our, that's our edge as a team. You know, you got to have that toughness and, and be gritty. Um, so we had stuff like jousting. So you're standing on an Agile One bag and you're hitting guys with Agile Ones. If you fell off the Agile One bag, the other guy wins. You know, you had the, the towel wrestling. We're trying to pull the towel out of the guy's back. And we did stuff. We had obstacle courses we'd set up in the snow. Um, guy jumping over snow banks out, out on the field and pull-ups and, you know, four four speed ladders with eight guys trying to get into the four speed ladders at the same time, you know, so you're getting, you're getting bumps and bruises and, uh, you know, guys are really uh, getting after each other and uh, it's fun. So the team competitions too, same thing. I mean, it could be, you know, shooting a hundred tennis balls on the field and whoever gets the most tennis balls on their team wins. Oh, wow. You know, just, yeah. I mean, get as creative as you, as you want with it. So, you know, there's a lot of, uh, there's actually a lot more thought process into the thing than, than you think. You know? Yes, it sounds <laughs> like it, man. That sounds fun. So you're building competition, you're building a team, like cohesiveness, and you're actually having fun. And they don't know that you're doing the other two because they just look at it as as fun and games. Right, right. Yeah. Oh, that that is awesome. Okay, I'll, I've always wanted to know this. Uh, so before y'all got there, the previous offense was more run heavy power scheme and stuff like this and now y'all are going like the other way were the kids more excited like what was the reaction when they found out y'all were coming to campus yeah i think all i mean all the receiving core obviously was they were doing back <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> and uh quarterbacks quarterbacks the same thing and then, you know it's funny for the running back a piece you know uh our, our guy kyle hill could have actually entered the draft last year and you know my first you know kind of conversation or back and forth with him was you know take a look at how the NFL now is evolving. Um, and, you know, look who, look who the first running back off the board was this year. Look who these guys are doing. You know, they're touting him as this, this pass receiver in the back that caught 50 balls. You know, we caught 148 passes two years ago. I had one season out of running backs. Our guy last year caught 86 passes, you know. So it's – that's what we're going to do. We're, we're going we're gonna to run the ball. We're going to catch the ball out of the backfield and be able to pass protect, which makes you an every down back. Um, and it also kind of saves a little bit on you. You know, it's not the, it's not the old school, you know, power where you have 20 guys in the box there and you can kind of run into a brick wall. So you can keep your backs healthier. They can showcase their abilities to make people miss and, and kind of break tackles and do all that. Um, and then they're, they're part of that pass game. So it's not like you have to be a, a third down back to do that or somebody else is in on first and second down. So it's all about the, you know, the all purpose yards and the touches and, and the touchdowns and, um, and all that. So really anybody on offense has got to love that. And our whole line for that matter, I guess the last uh, three out of the last four years, and we had a, we had a draft pick on the old line. We had a first rounder years ago. And those guys now with the bigger line splits, you know, they're on an Island a little bit and then they're pass protecting versus those defensive ends and edge rushers that, you know, one of the highest paid guys on defense too, because they're trying to get to the quarterback, right? The quarterback's the most highest paid guy in the NFL. What do you got to do? You got to protect your investment. Next highest paid guy, tackles. You know, so we're going to pump out some tackles. Now that's that's a fact. You know, and Mississippi State's had some good old line anyhow, and and you know we we've, we've developed some guys that were you know Andre Diller when we got in Washington State was a 240 pound tight end. You know, left as a first round draft pick, and for him was Cole Madison. He was a tight end. He went to the Packers, and Joe Dahl was a uh, FCS transfer that is still playing with the Lions now. Those guys all kind of develop themselves and develop their skills to that skill set that, you know, translates again to the next level. So I think anybody across the board on offense, I think is pretty fired up. Good. Now, how um, y'all got a little bit of practice time with spring ball. How, how, how much did y'all actually get to work with the kids before the coronation hit? Yes, yeah, so we, we were just out there for those, those off-season competitions and the maneuver stuff. And uh, we had just started having some meetings, you know, and then no practices. So 
you know, even though our offense goes in in three days, we, you know, we'd like to steal a couple of those days back, which I think we'll get uh, you know, as long as things keep proceeding the way they are. Right now, they just announced today that we'll be back in the office on June 8th, uh, okay. players soon after for uh, limited and voluntary uh, kind of workouts and stuff like that to strength coaches. So we'll be around the building a little bit and we'll kind of get back in shape and, and start getting them ready to roll for July. Um, and hopefully the one plan I did see was July 15th would be like a, a key day to kind of start the season and roll right into the season from there. So it adds a couple weeks to you, which you can kind of get that spring ball back. So for us, if we were able to have some kind of OTA or light helmets and t-shirt, you know, run through meeting, walk through meeting for a week or two, we'd be able to get the offense in nuts and bolts. And then once when we put the pads on, it wouldn't be any real focus on having to get lined up or calling a certain play. They'd have that down. Then we can just practice um, understanding, you know, when we see coverage or, you know, where our reads are or footwork and stuff like that. Do you think that's one of the benefits to the air raid? Cause it's not that much and it's kind of repetition so they can get better faster than all of these other offenses that have like a bajillion plays and tweaks mm -hmm. and everything like that. Do you see this as an advantage now than, I don't know, in any other time? Absolutely. No, absolutely. I mean, the beauty and simplicity, that's when you know, people ask about, you know, our offense, whatever it's like this play or that play, it's not the plays. It's, it's the uh, kind of the discipline to really stick with the plays that work and then be able to adapt those plays and disguise them and dress them up, but, but stay true to what we, you know, we believe in type of things. So I think that's really what the, the kind of real geniuses of the offense, you know, we're going to, we're not going to, uh, you know, if you like a certain play that, that attacks a curl flat area, we, know we might already have a play that does that. So if we want to put your play in, the other play is going to get out. You know, that's, that's, that's kind of the, um, you know, the rule to that and that type of thing. So yeah, a situation like this, um, a couple of weeks through, I mean, you know, two times through six practices, you, you'd hit those concepts twice each day. And that's how we kind of split up. So you have a third of the offense goes in each day. So a third of the quick game, a third of the drop back, third of the runs, third of the screens. And then you just kind of keep on repeating, rinse and repeating. But shoot, by the time you get to, you know, if you did that for two weeks, by the time you got to that third week, they're, they're, they're humming along pretty good. I want to talk about the install just a little bit. So let's say for that first three days, I'm doing cross that. So when you put in cross, are you doing it kind of like at every formation or is there like a strict, okay, Day one through three, I just want to do it at a two by two. And then day four through six, I just want to do it at a three by one. Or is it when we put in cross, we're putting in all the variations we like, and we're just going to see which one sticks. What's the thought process on that? Um, just an evolution, I think, from week to week. So, you know, week one would just be base uh, formations and base concepts. So, you know, two by two, Y cross, three by one, Y cross, 20 personnel, Y cross, um, and just run it that way. And then the second time through, depending on how the first time went, maybe it's the same thing. Or maybe now we might add emotion into it, or you might add, hey, we're going to post this guy this time. But it just kind of evolves as you go along. But again, start start with the basics, start with the fundamental foundation of the play, and, and uh, you know keep that integrity and in the concept, uh, keep that intact uh, first, and don't move on until you, you feel you're confident that they they grasp that. You know. Okay. On that, to piggyback off the, on that, how soon do you put in tags for your base plays? Like, do they have to perfect the play first before you even think about adding a tag, or does the tag go on the same day the base play goes on? It, it, yeah, it'll, it'll take a little bit. I mean, again, maybe, maybe it's two practices, you know, but then you might have to force feed it too. I mean, you can't wait forever to make sure you're getting all these little nuances in. So, you know, maybe the third, third time through that same concept, we, we need to start doing something a little bit differently and you start building upon it and kind of teach to that highest common denominator too. I mean, if there's a guy struggling, we got, we got to pick him up and give it the rest of the guys, you know, um, what hurts in the off season is you don't get the rapport and the chemistry that they would have had, you know, so after spring ball, they would have had all those kind of captains practices where they're on their own out there throwing and developing a lot of the timing and all that, but that'll, that'll come, you know, that'll come when we get those couple weeks back. Okay. So yeah. What is, is y'all just getting like, let's say two weeks and then boom, the season starts or what y'all probably heard like, a lot more than what we have heard. We at South Carolina, we've been, we're kept in the dark. We have no idea what's going on. Nothing. We're just like, Hey, stay by your phone. And when you get the 
the call, just be ready. Yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah. No, I think it's the one, the plan that I saw, I mean, I, I guess I'm just the most optimistic about this plan. So I'm, I'm kind of hoping for it, but it was, you know, July 15th through, you know, start on time. So typically we'd start like around August, that first week in August. So they're adding two weeks to the mix to kind of get the guys back in shape uh, make sure they're healthy make sure that they're ready to, to go through a season grind. So I think what we would do with those first couple of weeks, like, like I said, was just kind of um, not a lot of bang it, no pads or anything like that. It's more, let's bounce around, let's get in condition, let's get lined up, let's run plays, let's, uh, let's start, you know, let's start putting those tags in, let's start seeing how things operate this way, you know, so two weeks into it, okay, we just kind of designate on our own. Now it's fall camp time, you know, now it's pads time. It's, uh, now we're in practice one of, uh, of summer, you know, that type of thing, but that would be, uh, that'd be ideal, I think, for us. All right, fingers crossed, because I'm I'm looking forward to y'all. Like I've got every game already DVR'd on my my YouTube cloud. I can't I can't <laughs> wait. Um, coming to formations again, when y'all go empty, is the running back still in it? Because that's that's a topic of discussion in the comments. Like, what what's your thought process on empty? Do you bring a new wide receiver in and have a true five wide? Or are you trying to keep the same personnel and just mess with the defense when you go empty is is your is your running back better than your fifth receiver i mean that's that's basically what it comes down to and we've been fortunate enough that we typically that's the the answer is yes you know so and you get a matchup problem too with that guy so if you watch the patriots uh you know when edelman run run that kind of juke play at an empty mm -hmm. same thing we've got our running back at number three position versus a mike linebacker we love that scenario so he's going to have them hash to hash in the middle of the field to go to go win a route, you know, and sometimes it's as easy as that. He's running a six yard, go ahead and win, you know, so he can break inside, he can break outside. He can, he can make him look at an angle route, but he's just going to go ahead and get open in the middle of the field. But, um, and sometimes it's, it's good for a decoy, but shoot, a lot of these plays line up good for a running back. You know, we can throw an arc screen to him and have the receivers blocking for him. Now you just put them all the way out there in the perimeter. You got to tackle your running back out there with the two receivers blocking two DBs. I don't know who's going to get them. You know, we, I think we averaged, we called that play not enough times. We called it six times last year and averaged 11 yards of completion. We should have called it wow. 60 times. You know what I mean? We yeah. should have ran that, you know, two, three times a game. Um, there's so much good stuff. That's the thing. There's so much good stuff that we do that it's hard to yeah. get calling the same plays over and over again, but you keep teams off balance a little bit. But yeah, I, I would say if you feel like he's one of your better players, he needs to be on the field. It's, it's, it's really that simple. Now, if you have a, your fifth receiver is better than your, than your running back, then you put your fifth receiver out there and let him be the guy to go and then go win, you know? That, that, yeah, that's, that's pretty simple. When you go empty now, I know in high school, when we go empty, it's because we have a dude at quarterback. We want to lighten the box and we want to run our guy. Washington state and Mike Leach quarterbacks in general, haven't been the most athletic back there. So what's the thought process when y'all go empty? Like what's the reasoning behind that? Uh, defense has to show their hand. I mean, that, that's one thing, right? You can't line up to that normally like you do anything else. So there's, there's two, you know, there's a couple of things they could do. They could either really, they could put those uh, three guys over two on each side if we're out in two by two uh, and have you really light in the middle of the field, or they can kind of keep the same box they had and then kind of leave those, uh, those perimeters again, a little more, you know, available that way. So this gives us a clean picture and even in pass protection wise, you know, versus blitz, you know, we don't mind that, you know, because we're, we're going to run hot. So then there's nobody left in the middle of the field and we're spaced out so wide, you know? So um, I think it just tips the hand of the defense for us. And, you know, one misconception I think too, is, you know, we've, we've had a few guys that can't weren't very mobile. Not that that's like a, that's not a, always a staple in recruiting. Hey, find a guy that can't move, but can really throw it. But yeah, everybody's <laughs> looking for the unicorn, you know, that could do both, yeah. you know, but when you find a guy like, you know, like a, you know, Gardner Minshew can run the ball, you know, effectively, and can move the pocket and extend plays. And every now and then he kind of, he'll tuck it and all of a sudden he's 15 yards up the field. You know, Luke Falk, who, who doesn't get the credit for being a, uh, you know, a, a runaround guy back there. I remember we played the Sun Bowl in 2015 against Miami. We don't even have like zone read in our playbook. And it was, it was third and six or seven. And if we get a first down there, the game's over and he pulls it and runs for like 11 yards, you know, and, uh, it was awesome. You know, he's up there. I'm just, it was like he uh, just won the Super Bowl in that play. It was cool to see. 
that you know that type of thing is that that's all you really want the guy to do when they get this plate and they give you something you take it and expose them and uh you know get them back to playing uh, their basic stuff you know okay is that going to be something I just foresee in the SEC having a little bit more mobile quarterback. And if that is the case that you do get, you know, the, the intangibles that coach Leach is looking for, plus the legs, are y'all going to kind of veer into more run oriented game? And if you do, that's, that, that's like uncharted territory, correct? Yeah. I'm not sure if it's too much design, you know, by design runs, you know, I'll say that. I mean, you know, I guess the number one thing we always say is we don't want to get our, our quarterback broken. You know, we, we don't want to get his head knocked off, you know, so. Uh, but if he can extend plays with his feet, you know, that creates big pass plays down the field too. You know, we run scramble drill starting in fall camp and that's once a week throughout the entire season. Um, and, and probably like twice a week during fall camp and leading up to it. Um, we'll, we'll just call concepts with five quarterbacks out there and then everybody, you know, will roll the pocket quarterback will roll one way or the other. Everybody has to break the route off and go to their landmark. So we, we practice that and put a lot of emphasis and time on that. So, when a quarterback can do that and extend the play and buy some time, we need to get open and we need, we need to punish people, you know, if they're not getting to the quarterback in time, you know. I like that you brought up the scramble drill. When you call those concepts, are they just different concepts? Like you just randomly call a concept and just to see, or is that scripted in there? Because I have a problem with what concepts do I try to do during scramble drills, like a rhyme or reason, or it's just like, Hey, here's the play. I really don't care what it is. We're going to work on the scrambling part. That's the emphasis of this drill. So, so by the time we get to like our Thursday practice is when we run it, that'll be those, those key plays that are on the script for that week. You know, so we're practicing plays that we're going to run in that game and then breaking it off on, on our landmarks. So the landmarks don't really, no matter what route you have, they don't really change. You know, whoever's got the deepest route is going to head to the deepest spot, you know, in the end zone to the back pylon. Whoever's got the, you know, the flat route is going to get in front of the quarterback's hand. Whoever's got the over route or, coming from across the formation and get their front pine line. So it's, everybody's got their landmarks. It doesn't really matter what you call. They should all just know, Hey, I'm the deep route on this one. I'm the short route on this one, that type of thing. So really just whatever you're calling for that week, you want to make sure you have a little more emphasis on those plays. Okay. All right. I like that. Now I have read some articles and it said that y'all might have like a hand down tight end or an H back. Are those true or false? Or can you give us anything? Because that right there, my friend is a, is a unicorn. <laughs> in this i cannot confirm in order to <laughs> <laughs> all i can say is all i can say is we have two or three guys that are about you know six four six five about 230 240 that can move so you know you got to find a way to play your best players so we'll figure it out okay so while y'all were figuring that out was that something new you had to figure out or is like how uncomfortable was that conversation to figure out what to do with those guys if you're going to do that? I don't think not at all. You know, it's just, again, another thing, everybody, everybody thinks of, uh, you know, Welker and Amendola and, you know, a couple guys we had say River Craycraft, you know, Kyle Sweet, last couple guys we had played for us. They all kind of fit that same type cast mold. And everybody said, well, that's, that's what we're looking for. Not necessarily, you know, it's just, uh, those are the guys we recruited. We like their skill sets. They're, they're good route runners and, um, you know, lots of good things that they do. And, you know, obviously those guys had good NFL careers and the whole thing, but if you have a bigger guy, you know, he's a matchup problem. That's all that is. You know, you, you got a, you got a big tall guy versus a backer. You got a guy in the red zone now. It's, it's just something that, you know, we don't typically recruit as many you know, tight end bodies, um, as maybe some other teams, but by no means are we biased to, you know, using a guy that looks like me, you know, who's a little more vertically challenged than, uh, you know, <laughs> that type of thing. So, It'll be fun to see, you know, just different body types and personnel that we have and uh, see how it all kind of plays out. Yes, I, I completely agree on that. Now, I would be remiss if I didn't ask you this because one of my favorite plays that y'all run is the uh, the shovel. I, I've never seen how to block it or anything like that. The only thing I've seen is that little clip where Coach Leach is like mocking someone that can't throw the shovel correctly. Uh, what – how do you block it and like what goes into it? Cause I know don't y'all like read the end. If the end goes around, the back's kind of like inside. If the end comes in, the back has to go outside. There's a lot of nuances in that play. Could you just walk us through it? Cause I'm gonna be honest. I, I, I freaking love it. I'm, I'm rambling right now. That's how much I love it. <laughs> um, I'd say the easiest way is just kind of block it, like draw, you know, make it look like pass, but you know, uncovered linemen, uncovered linemen go to the next level. 
you know, if they're covered up, they'll block a guy. Um, if you can get to the next stage where, you know, an edge rusher on a tackle and the tackle can kind of feel at the back is past and kind of release and work up, that's kind of like the second stage. But first things first, like I said, would just be if you're uncovered, climb to the second level, everybody else is kind of in kind of quick pass set and then, and then work from there. But like you said, the back, you know, you, you can't be right on the defensive front. You know, if the guy, if the guy fills the inside gap, you turn outside. If the guy rushes up the field, you insert on the inside gap. You know, the quarterback and kind of the coach was talking about was he's going to option pitch it to him basically um, to the shoulder away from where the defense is at. And we do that even in, in our, you know, our mesh pass play. We run that, you know, or sell a new drill. Whatever side that number gets hit with the ball, that's the side you need to catch, tuck, turn, and hit up the field that way because the QB is leading away from the, uh, the danger. So, you know, if you're in a five technique, the guy spikes inside, back steps up, he turns outside, quarterback throws it to him on his outside shoulder, he can turn and just kind of head up the edge that way. If the guy stayed and rushed up the field, uh, running back would turn inside, and then the quarterback kind of just hit him wherever he thought the best departure angle for him would be. So, um, again, yeah, it's pretty, it's pretty multiple and versatile, and uh, you can't really uh, – if you run it well, it takes some time. You've got the best time in it. Um, but it's, it's tough to kind of defend that play. Okay. Is it a dual read play? Like, is he saying, okay, I'm going to try to throw a stick? Cause you know, in, in a lot of teams have like when there's a screen or something, it's a dual read screen, like stick or slow screen or some of like that. Is that similar? Or is it just like, Hey, this is what I called. Uh, this is where it's going to, you just give a good fake and then do the option type flip. Yeah. What would be more like, we'll get out of the play if we don't like to look, you know, uh, that type of thing. The quarterback needs, needs to get out of it. If there's a, uh, you know, if they got a nickel or somebody pressed up on a line of scrimmage and they have a heavier front, we don't feel like there's space for the, for the, you know, to operate, call a different play, get out of there, you know? So yeah. we don't, you know, we don't really have any RPOs. We, it's just not something that we, uh, we major in. And, you know, a couple of years back, we had talked about, you know, we ran stick draw in the spring probably four or five years ago. And we kind of statted it out. And then we just looked at when we ran stick by itself, we averaged this. We ran draw by itself, we averaged that. We ran stick draw, it averaged this, and it was last, you know, so we just, you know, we're, we're going to call a pass, we're going to throw the pass, we call the run, we're going we're to run it, you know, that's kind of how it goes. Okay, I like that. Um, one of the things that is said about the air raid is everyone likes to run it until there's bad weather. Do y'all, do y'all game plan that, or y'all just like, hey, I don't care about it, this is what we do, uh, if it rains, it rains, if it snows, it snows. Well, what's the thought process in the coaches meeting if you look at the weather and you say, oh, crap, it's, it's, it's going to be bad this week? Wet ball Tuesday. Wet ball Tuesday is our thing. So we have uh, – we got buckets out there, um, you know, pails filled with water. So every drill that those guys do, they're throwing wet balls around all day. So every Tuesday, that's, that's, their, that's their deal. So all through, like, the, the quick game, the routes on air, the pat and go, any, any drill work they have, they're probably getting a solid hour worth of throwing wet footballs around. Um, you know, snow really isn't as big a deal. Snow is a little more, doesn't kind of make the, you know, the ball entirely. But we had a game a couple of years ago that was just absurd. But I mean, I didn't prepare for that. I mean, it's a, it's a, it's a blizzard. I mean, you can't see the field. So um, that obviously wasn't in our favor that, that, that day there. But, um, you know, a little bit of rain, a little bit of rain for us is fine. Because, you know, again, what it does, it neutralizes the other team's pass game, makes them one dimensional. We're still going to do what we do. And guess what? We, and we might. If they keep playing us the same way, we're going to run the ball a little, a little bit better probably too in, the, in, that, in that course. We played, uh, I guess we played Colorado was it, uh, last year in a rain game, you know, and then, uh, you know, the back went off for, you know, almost 200 all-purpose yards uh, running and receiving. So it, it's just probably an advantage, honestly, for us, you know. And you have to be happy now in, in Mississippi. You don't really have to worry about a blizzard. Yeah. Or maybe, yeah, we can cut out some of the, the, the wet ball practice drills and uh, <laughs> yeah, the blizzard we don't have to worry about. Yeah. No, not at all. Because that, I, that has to suck. Cause I remember what game you're talking about. And I mean, I could barely even see the players during that game on TV when I was in my, uh, my warm house. <laughs> <laughs> well, I got, I got coach Miller, the old line coach on the headset and he's, uh, he's like, Neely, what happened there? I'm like, I'm like, no, it was, you know, it was the tackle, you know? Which one? The left or the right tackle? I'm like, right tackle. He's right in front of you. I can't see him. You know, the whole yeah, man. unbelievable. Yeah. <laughs> um, real quick, I, I know y'all have a, a, a set 
number of passing concepts. Is that the same as running concepts? Like, do y'all just have a core group? I know inside zone, and is that really it, or do you do a lot of? I know I've seen Dart before, but what are you, what are the core run schemes in y'all's offense? Yeah, so like before, just kind of talk a little bit about how inside zone can morph in the mid zone for us. So that's kind of just one play. You know, we run a little gap scheme with the guard in the center, um, and that can kind of we can just marry up who pulls instead of the guard pulling. Then then you start running dart a little bit. You know, we have our draw play, we have the shovel pass, and those are really the kind of the core plays. You know, so you know we go into a game plan thinking that hey, these are our top three ways to run the ball this week against these guys, you know, and uh, just kind of stick to those. And, and again, just be good against, be really good against any any front or any pressures or, or anything like that. Okay. I have to ask you, which one of the air raid concepts do you love the most? Why cross? It was just, that's why I was kind of referenced that one first. Was, why why just, do you like the why cross so much? I just, I just don't know how you can – you can't defend all five guys. I mean, I, I can pull clips for days on each different other positions of the five positions out there, you know, out of two by two, who we've hit, yards, touchdowns. I mean, everybody's getting getting a taste of that. So, um, it's just tough to defend. And, again, that's a, it's a true progression read for a quarterback, which makes it pretty, pretty simple for him. And um, as they get better and better in the system, they, I mean, they can move through that thing pretty quick. And you're getting big money. It's not just a completion, you know, because uh, we married up our, you know, kind of wide sale to wide cross. So even the number two receiver is running a, a 10 yard out route. And that's probably the, you know, the worst um, kind of uh, depth of down the field you're going to get on, on that play. You got a vertical route, you got a crosser that could be, you know, anywhere from 18 to 22. You got a post dig. The back in the flat has been just unbelievable for us because you get all the clear out from everybody. So the, so the coverage drops. He releases late into the flat over there, and then it's just, you know, those are the ones where I, uh, you know, I'm yelling. The, I'm, as soon as he drops back, I'm yelling the back, the back, the back, because I want to see this guy go out there and party, man. You know? <laughs> What's a good? Okay, I'm I'm putting that in. I I agree with you. I love the Y cross. What's a good coaching point that you can tell me that I then can relay to my players about that play? This is, this is a funny one. So. Uh, Graham Harrell and I, we, we were uh, we were a few C's at the same time for about six months. When he, yeah, he was at Washington State, he's at USC now. But um, we joke around. We'd always used to crash uh, Coach Leach's quarterback meetings, you know, just kind of say something and then run run out of the back of the room while the quarterbacks are in there. But reads are sacred, you know. So he's got a you know kind of list of his quarterback rules. But you know, number one on there is the reads are sacred. So when you run wide cross. Don't don't get cute with it. Don't don't uh, reinvent the wheel or overanalyze anything. Go through your reads. Start with number one, two, three, four, five. If you do that, uh, you're, you're gonna be in good shape. Okay, Damn. it's that simple, huh? Yeah, yeah. No, that that play. That's what I'm saying. That play. That play of all of them for me is just. Uh, that's why I think it's like just a, such a great concept because they can't be right on defense. You know, depending on what they do. I mean, you know, so. Somebody drives down on, you know, the wide cross. We, we can run the post behind them, you know, for, for a touchdown. If they're if they're playing zone, we keep running. So the post dig is going to run and, and then curl back and sit in a hole. If they're running man covers and he just stays in, on his on his path, there's no there's nothing that we see on defense out of that play that we don't like because because again you can attack wherever the dead spot is. It's going to show up if you just go through the read. It's going to show up. On the flip side, what's one of your least favorite? air raid concepts oh, that's a good and you got to have one you got to have one everyone has yeah. one that they're just like <laughs> ah, i'm not that sold on it uh you know shallow last year was it was a better play for us than it has been um yeah i guess why sale which we married to cross i would say basically eliminated why sale by itself and i guess the thought process there was you know, you go through two reads on the front side, and then the next guy that was really viable was the Z all the way on the back. So it was hard for the quarterback to kind of – the times that he didn't get to the Z, the Z might have been wide open. Or if, he, if you know, if you want to start with the Z, you start there, you can't get back to the front side. So it just it made it a little more difficult to read that play for a drop back. So um, that's one that I probably I probably wouldn't resurrect either. I'll let that one uh, sleeping dog lie there. We were running out of two back, out of 20 personnel. Um, and then it's a little bit better. Now you have you got the back involved, and you got three guys on one side. So that's that's another a better way of running, it, in my opinion. Okay. Um, we got a question in chat. How much of the option route from the backfield did your 
did you use in the last couple of years? Yeah, I mean, four vertical, four verticals and off route is probably one of the better plays for the back that we have. I mean, again, it's just a, it's a Mike linebacker. We're going to, we're going to insert best release possible through the line of scrimmage and then leverage away from him. You know, he's inside of us. We're going to put a foot in the ground towards him, work away flat. If he's outside of us. We're going to work to the inside. If it's man coverage, foot in the ground and then run flat. So we feel like, you know, again, we feel like we like that matchup quite a bit. So the option route is really, uh, that's really a pretty good one for us. And we'll run angle off of a couple different concepts too. Winds up in the same area he does on an option route. And then kind of same thinking. He knows if it's zone, he can sit it. If he's getting chased or he sees, you know, he feels it, he just keeps running. So any of that stuff in the middle of the field to the back is uh, – that kind of takes the place of some of our middle screen running back game, which we, we, we don't kind of – we don't do as much of that as, as maybe some other teams do, but that kind of takes the place of it. I'm a high school coach. I want to I want to use the running back more. So this is a two part question. What concept should I use to get the ball more in the running back's hands? And then the second one is, what play should I tag the angle route for the back if I was just that's the only thing I was going to do? Yeah, man. Again, I, I think anything that you know, any down the field vertical routes, stuff that stretches the defense and creates that space, and kind of like the play that. You know, I commented on that you posted. You know, I mean, that's that's what you that's what you want. You want to you want to send the defenders down the field on your receivers, and then give the back all that room to operate. You know, um, so anything anything vertical down the field, and then anything gets the ball in his hands fast. You know, on the perimeter. You know, as, as long as you can you can block it up and kind of draw it up that way. So, you know, we'll have a couple of plays like that. Honestly, we we just turn and fire it to him and block for him and let him let him go do, do his thing. It. Yeah. Yeah. What are your coaching points on angle? Like, what are you teaching the running back to do? Angle should look like a shoot route for, you know, the first thing, a few steps, you know, so you really want to, you want to sell that same action. You want that backer screaming like he thinks it's going to be a, you know, immediate flat route, you know, hard stick in the ground, get across his face, you know, violent rip across his, that guy's face. If it's a zone drop, you could stop there at the top of your route. So when you can run that first part of the angle and then just kind of drift in that hole, if he doesn't push towards you, start running your angle route. He pushes towards you, get across his face. He sits home, sit in the hole. So it's just make it look the same, make it look like a shoot route. And then read if it's, uh, you know, if, he, if he's going to cover me, mug me up, or if he's going to sit in, you know, in his spot or zone in the field. So you just got to understand if you're going to keep running or you're going to sit. All right. When you're, when you're in the, your, your, your group meetings with your running back, what do you – cover a lot more of like are you looking more at pass protection type plays more run uh more passing routes like what walk us through if I was to come into your group meeting and sit down as a running back what are you preaching doing and all of that yeah I think the, the run stuff is more uh you, you want to stay true to those base you know rules like, like I kind of talked about earlier so like if, if a guy makes an exception play uh I want to make a point that it's a good job of seeing that with your eyes, right? Not just being a robot and, and following straight lines, but understanding, hey, if, if you did cut it back here, I think you still would have had a, you know, a positive five plus yard gain if you just stuck to the rules. So don't do this every time. I'm fine with this one here, but you know, that kind of thing. So really reinforcing the run game. We want to keep them consistent. We want to get downhill. We, we, you know, we want to fall forward. We want to get positive yards all the time in the run game. Um, pass protection again a lot of that is being able to uh, read defenses understand alignments and uh, I guess that ties in the run game too but seeing where the ball is going to hit seeing where your read might be and then seeing where the pass protection is going to come are they going to come are they not going to come how do I get out if I'm running a certain route hey my first steps at my threat my second steps on my route he's blitzing the quarterback my third steps back to him I'm in pass protection technique now you know it's going to be going to that phase if not Second step on my route, he's looking at me. Third step, I'm out on my path, and I'm, you know, I'm stressing somebody out there in space. And then uh, where we left, you know, catching the ball stuff is, is I guess, or, or the routes is probably, uh, you know, probably maybe the least of uh, the least that I, I kind of focus on because again, we hit it so much in practice, and then it's just a matter of, hey, make sure we're make sure we're noosing that ball, catching it when we're heading the way the quarterback throws us, or. Um, those types of things or sitting or sitting in a hole or, you know, keep running up, you know, seeing the defenders and being able to understand what coverage they're in. Okay. All right. Well, coach, I, I appreciate it. I don't want to take up too much time of your time. We've been here for almost an hour and a half and I could talk to you for another an hour and a half. <laughs> uh, 
I, I, I appreciate you being here. I'm going to drop your Twitter in the chat. I'll also put that in the description as well. Is there anything you want to promote or anything like going on? Are you doing a clinic? I know you've been on the clinic circuit a little bit with this whole Corona slash Zumapalooza type deal. <laughs> Is there anything now, you want to say to the Hey man, just hail state and, uh, you know, getting, you know, the, uh, the air raid running backs, man, we're, we're trying to get this revolution, man. As many of these guys, in the NFL as we can, man. So yes, uh, we can still be tough. We can, we can still be tough and, and run our offense. And uh, our old line talks about that all the time too, man. So, uh, appreciate the time and, uh, um, fun shopping up here during the coronavirus. Hope everybody stays safe and we get back to football here pretty quick. Yes, I can't wait. I have my cowbell already. I ordered it from Amazon. I'm going to piss off my wife and daughter when we finally play on Saturday. Are you finally playing on Saturdays? I'm going to be on my couch just, <laughs> just swinging it left and right. Well, uh, coaches, it. thank you all for joining us. Coach, thank you again so much. This, this was awesome. I appreciate it. And Thanks, uh, hey, coaches, until next time, let's continue to master the spread, score points, and have fun. Y'all have a great